Hello beautiful watchers and welcome back to the Don Reviews The Prisoner where we'll be having a look at episodes 2 and 3 of one of the more famously bizarre British TV shows to come out of the 60s. Up first, episode 2, The Chimes of Big Ben. Interesting factoid for my American brothers, this is not Big Ben. This is Elizabeth Tower. This is Big Ben. It's specifically the name of one of the bells rather than the building itself or the big ass clock. You are most welcome for this entirely useless piece of information. Though it was the second episode to air, it's been pretty much since confirmed that the Prisoner episodes ended up being shown out of their originally intended order, and there are indeed several indicators that support this in the chimes of Big Ben. Number two nostalgically reminisces of Six about his arriving in the village as if it had happened quite a while ago. Then, in later episodes, they talk to him as if he had only just arrived. He also appears to have formed certain relationships with the other residents, which completely disappear in the following episodes. A possible reason for this would be to space out the appearances of Leo McKern, the number two who returns for the final episode. This is also one of the best episodes they might have released it early in order to draw in audiences. Leo McKern is probably my favourite of all the number twos. He has some of the best lines and his delivery of them is fantastic. He can make even the act. Of putting on his dressing gown appear as a gesture of defiance. I was also quite amused by his almost bipolar changes of mood. <laughs> You'll be back! He's also one of the few people in the world who can pull off the words I SAY and not sound like he's doing it ironically. I SAY! So the episode starts with number 6 defiantly putting his radio in the fridge so he doesn't have to listen to the public announcement regarding an upcoming arts and crafts fair. Slightly later in the day, number 2 points out a new arrival to the village, a young lady of apparent Russian descent who is to be dubbed number 8. 6 is suspicious of her at first, but multiple escape and suicide attempts lead him to believe she may well be the genuine article. He negotiates with number 2 for her to be put into his charge for safekeeping. Keeping. In exchange, he offers the only act of collaboration he ever submits to during his entire stint in the village. He will participate in the Arts and Crafts Fair. Overweening sense of self-importance. A while here, his egomania has, if anything, increased. Well, Despite mocking him for his inflated sense of self-importance, number two actually agrees. Settling down, I hope. Thank you. No swimming today, eh? Mm. No, off to the woods. Naughty, naughty. Did number two just make a sex joke? Number six takes number eight out to the woods where they discuss the possibility that number eight knows the location of the village. How six deduced this out of thin air isn't quite clear to me, but I suppose that's really a drop in a bucket in regards to this show's lack of sense making. While number eight is considering her options, six starts working on his crafts project. Okay, that's a boat. That's quite clearly a boat. He tries to pass it off as abstract art, but anyone with two brain cells to rub together will quite clearly be able to tell that that is a boat. It, uh represents our fear of the unknown. Eight and Six eventually agree to work together to escape the village. Another interesting factoid, McGowan was consistently and intensely opposed to any sort of on-screen romance. He vetoed a possible sex scene in this episode, and he refused to so much as touch any actress in an affectionate way. To even get him to put his arm around a girl required the producers to bring in his biological daughter and stick her in a wig. He was that uncomfortable with the idea of touching a woman. Anyways, in this scene, as they hatch their plans, you're given the first of two reasons for the name of the episode. Oh, do you really know what I want? To hear the chimes of Big Bill. Big Ben. Sometime later, Six wins the Arts and Crafts Fair with his boat, and the authorities of the village seem content that he's settling down to become a member of their weird insular society. However, that very same night, Six and Eight sneak back in to pick up their boat, and what do you know, it turns out to have been a boat all along, and they make their escape. They apparently get all the way to the Polish coast before number two catches on and six rover on them. A friend of number eight, who somehow knew they were coming, manages to drive rover off with a rifle. The next step of the plan is to deliver them to London via Daising and Copenhagen in a packing crate. Number six commandeers the man's watch, as his was destroyed in his recent terrified swim to the shore. Many hours and a claustrophobic nightmare later, six and eight arrive in number six's former employer's office. <laughs> They make him reasonably welcome, but confess they are a tad suspicious of the fact that he disappeared shortly after resigning without giving them an explanation, and then he just turned up again later from a country that's on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. Six gives them a brief explanation of the village, and they seem inclined to believe him on one condition. He confesses why he resigned his job. I resigned. Because... This is it. The moment everyone's been waiting for, for... Two episodes. See, I told you this episode was out of chronological order. However, at the very last second... I resigned. 
Because for a very long time, I s- just a minute. Eight o'clock. Big Ben. It's just struck eight. My watch says eight. So? I was given this watch by a man in Poland. Would you like to explain to me how a man in Poland came to have a watch showing English time when there's one hour's difference? Holy shit, that's how Six catches on that something's amiss? This man's attention to detail borders on the autistic! So, as you've probably guessed by now, everything in this episode has been a sham. The craft's fair, the village's insane inability to recognise a boat when they see one, the whole escape, what Six thought was the Polish coast, the journey, the not-quite-love interest? It was all set up by the village to get Six to spill the beans. And how does Six react to this? He just spent the last couple of days chopping down trees with nothing but a stone axe, an entire night sailing in a makeshift boat, he swam in freezing waters fleeing Rover, and now he just spent God knows how long crammed in a crate. He believed he had finally got his freedom, only to realise he never left the village in the first place, and the person he put his trust in, and unwittingly revealed his bell fetish to, was his enemy all along. And what does he do? Seeing it. Mm. Cold blooded. Okay, you're gonna have to forgive me for what is, I assure you, an uncharacteristic outburst of national pride, but this really is the embodiment of the British unbroken spirit. Other countries may like their heroes so full of passion it sometimes comes spilling out in uncontrolled rage, and that is fine, but faced with overwhelming defeat, there can be no more British reaction than calmly saying goodbye and heading off for a nap. Never let them see you bleed, number six. Next in line, A, B, and C. This episode starts with the new number two being told over the dreaded number one phone that his ass is on the line and he'll be going to the big village in the sky soon if he doesn't get something out of number six. This is one of my favourite episodes, mostly due to the amazing sense of foreboding they set up around number one. He's represented by his red phone and number two's constant fearful glances towards it convey a remarkable sense of tone. It's little touches like this that made the prisoner so memorable. In desperation, two brings in a scientist dubbed number 14 and green lights a dangerous new procedure that apparently involves drugging number six and hooking him up to a computer. What's all that about? Energy from his brain. Thoughts. Like sound waves. Converted into electrical impulses. And finally, into pictures. Your science is silly. But I'll allow it. I'm just glad no one's really got a dream reading device in reality. Fourteen sets number six up in this drug-induced virtual reality which takes the form of a swanky upper-class party run by an eccentric French woman. Apparently this was a popular hangout for super spies back in the day. Number two explains that he believes number six was intending to defect when he quit his job, and he wants to discover where he was heading. I'm not entirely sure why he thought someone would give two weeks notice before selling out his country, but there you are. He's narrowed it down to three possible groups and he's digitised the profiles of three people who represented these groups so he can present them to six in the virtual world and see which one he reacts to. Another thing I like about this episode is the opportunity it gives us to see what Six was like outside the village back in his natural element as a secret agent. Man, he was one charming mother lover. The first program they send in is another British agent who apparently famously defected a few years before. This is a complete bust as Six reacts to him the same way he might a genital wart. And even when he kidnaps him to take him to his master, Six just beats the living tar out of them. Number 14 then advises that number six needs 24 hours to recover from the drug before they can proceed with the next scenario. Number six wakes up with what looks like a killer hangover and a needle mark on his wrist. He happens to instantly spy number 14, nice plot convenience there fellas, who he half remembers from the night before during a brief moment of lucidity. He approaches her and attempts to trick her into revealing what she's doing with some clever word games. When that doesn't work, he tries the same thing on number two. He doesn't get much out of him, but does deduce that something's afoot and makes number two as nervous as fuck. Later that day, and one drugged cup of tea later, Six is back in the virtual party. This time he's being presented with an old spy friend of his who asks him for help. Apparently she is to be killed if he doesn't give up the information on why he resigned. This falls apart the second she puts on the damsel in distress act. Apparently this woman in reality would have scoffed in the face of danger like this. Once again waking up with a headache and a new mark, number six decides to tail number 14 and discovers her secret laboratory. He breaks his way in and comes across her mind rape machine. Number six once again shows us his superhuman powers of deduction by instantly realising what is happening and what role the drug is playing. 
Being the Lord High King of sneakiness, he chooses to dilute the dose he's about to receive and leave everything how it was. I might have been tempted to simply smash the mind rate machine, but that's just me. Yet another drugging later, ye gods he's going to be developing some serious brain damage soon, number six is once again back in the dream world. The third scenario apparently involves some unknown agent no one has ever seen before who turns out to be the eccentric hostess of the party. Six agrees to come and work for her boss and she sets up a meeting. Two is virtually drooling at this point of the idea of discovering the identity of this new mystery man and finally finding out the reason why number six resigned. But to his shock and dismay, it turns out that the lessened dose number six was shot up with has allowed him to take control over the dream and he's just been giving the village a taste of its own medicine and fucking with their heads. And number six is nice enough to at least rule one thing out for the village. I wasn't selling out. That wasn't the reason I resigned. But I very much doubt that's going to be enough to save this particular number two. If my theory about the producers mixing up the episodes in order to show the really good stuff first is correct, then I think it really paid off. I defy anyone to watch these two episodes and not be completely hooked on this show. Until next time, my beautiful watchers, be seeing you.